Hello and welcome to HMA Talk. I'm Mark Orchard, Chief Financial Officer at Portsmouth Hospitals. And in this episode, I get to connect with our HMA President, Lee Bond. Lee is our 72nd leader of the Healthcare Financial Management Association and has a call to arms presidential theme for the year, which is strength in numbers. And more on that in our conversation later, I'm sure. Lee is also the Chief Financial Officer for two statutory bodies, Hull University Hospitals NHS Trust and North Lincolnshire and Gould NHS Foundation Trust, therefore covering both sides of the Humber Bridge. So why don't we get going? Welcome Lee to the podcast and get acquainted. Lee, how are you? I'm fine, Mark. Thank you. Thank you for that kind introduction. Oh, you're very welcome. How's, um, how's things on site today? I know it's been... We've done a bit of a chat before we got on air. It's a bit of a busy uh, period, period it, for both our, our it's, trusts. It's a challenging time, both operationally and, and, and more importantly, we, we get into that strange time of the year, aren't we, where we're almost taking our eye off the month, off, off the year, year position and, and concentrating solely on 23-24. But we've still got to keep a little eye on making sure that months 10, 11 and 12 um, do what we say we, we they need to do. Um, I'm reasonably comfortable with with that. Um, so that, that, that my prime focus at the moment, besides supporting the daily sort of op- operational grind, is to try and uh, navigate a reasonable plan for twenty three twenty four. And I have to say, at this point in time, um, that looks like a a rather large task. Yeah, I mean exactly the same same place, Lee. And we we perhaps drift into that in a bit during the during the podcast. Listen, listen, Lee, it's really good to have you on the podcast. Um, over the course of our conversation, uh, the, what, I, what I thought we'd do, Lee, if that's okay, is split our time in three. So, um, so what I thought we'd do this time round is first of all, um, I wanted to learn a bit more about you, the president, President H. May. Learn a bit more about your theme, uh, your ambitions for the year. So that's the first thing. I want to spend quite a bit of time there, obviously, because um because that'll be really important to our listeners the second thing is i i, I want to get into a bit about sort of you you in the day job really um bit what you just got into um bit about your career so far a um, bit more about the role you're doing doing right now particularly across the two organizations that are described in the intro and then and then last but not least and really important i like to get into on these podcasts lee is a bit about you the person so your interests hobbies uh, may even test out some new quick fire fun questions with you towards the end as well so, perfect no problem um let's start then uh, you the president so um i probably should start by saying that we are recording this at the beginning of february 2023 uh, about two months into you being handed the presidential baton from owen harkin that what was in my view uh, one of the well uh, forget my view it was one of the best attended hma annual conferences i think in recent memory so well well done on that so lee um HMA presidential episode number 72, strength in numbers. Why don't we start, right, with you unpacking what it means, first of all, for you to be president of HMA, particularly at this time, Lee, and then we'll get into a bit more about your theme. It, 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 the Star Wars thing was really interesting because um, I had a, a, Mark and I had a, a, a very uh, <laughs> entertaining set of conversations about, uh, about that in particular. So I, had a few, I, I said that uh, I thought, Star Wars was great um, as a, as a theme, but in particular, I wanted to go along the lines of the Empire Strikes Back. I've I've sat and obviously worked closely with with my organisation over the last three or four years, uh, particularly during the the, the pandemic and and, 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 the, and the more recent period, and I have seen a movement away from a lot of what I would see is good financial discipline. Yeah, um, and, and 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 a weakening of the financial discipline within the organisations that I work in. And, and I'm not saying that's necessarily a bad thing. It was just it's just a matter of fact, if you like. Um, we've had to do different things. We've seen the emergence of the, of the particularly of the, the the people agenda, yeah. um, more and more. And, and and finance has taken a bit of a back seat to a degree. And what I wanted to say was, and I think a lot of people have recognised this, the country, the government have spent a lot of money over the last three years. Um, there is a recognition that at some point that's got to be paid back. There is a recognition that at some point that the, the, uh, the allocations that we've had, if I think about those first, that first six months of 2020, where they effectively said, spend what you want, it doesn't matter. That, that's not a 
tenable long-term proposition for any government and for any NHS, uh, any part of the NHS. So, so what I wanted to see was a return of, um, of, 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 of the financial sort of discipline. Now, there's two ways. If I, if I go back to my Star Wars analogy, there's two yeah. ways you could look at this. You could say that was more return of the Jedi, return of the good guys, the return of the Force, and all of that sort of stuff. Um, but, and I'm a realist in this, finance aren't necessarily viewed as being the good guys in any of this. Um, a lot of the time, working as a finance director, and I'm sure you'll have the same, a lot of the time we spend our, our, our lives saying no to things. Yeah, sadly. Um, and, uh, yeah, unfortunately. So in that regard, I thought that we were more like the empire. Um, so there is, so, so, so I was drawn to the empire striking back in that we've got to get finance back on the agenda. We might not like it, but it's got to come back and take some form, not necessarily the ascendancy, that maybe you would argue that it had back in the days of, of the foundation, early, early days of FTs, um, but it's got to get back on the, on, on, the top, on the top table alongside quality, patient experience, um, staffing and performance. It's, it's, got, it's got to be back, back amongst it. So that's where the Empire Strikes Back came from. Um, we, like I say, we, we, we sort of ummed and ahed about it. Mark at one point had got an eight-foot Darth Vader walking around the conference hall, <laughs> uh, which, we, which, which we, unfortunately we couldn't find anyone tall enough. Um, so uh, so, so that's where, uh, that was the genesis of it. But, but, right. but, but also that was the genesis of the strength in numbers thing. Yeah, There's something yeah. about... We have to get back to uh, a position where finance is a key part of the discussion. I'm not saying it's not a key part of the discussion, but it's not quite what it was, I don't think. And I think that sentiment is felt, particularly amongst uh, colleague finance directors, it needs to reassert itself and, and, and get back in there because the mood music that was coming out from the Department of Health and Treasury during... 22, 20, start of 22, 23, which has been followed up in the guidance now for 23, 24 and the, and the, and the draft allocations we're starting to see, certainly bears out the fact that the, 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 the money tree has shed all its leaves and we're back in a really difficult, really difficult financial position now. Um, and, and we're starting to see some really eye-watering um, deficit numbers starting to appear at ICS level across the country. It's not just one organisation, it's across the country. And I don't suspect it's even just one sector, although I suspect the acute sector are probably the hardest hit. But even with, if I think about the, the emerging ICBs and their 30% management cuts that they've got to make, everywhere starting to feel the pinch of the financial regime coming back to bite Hence, the empire strikes back. Excellent. All right. No, I get, I get that. Um, I, um, I'm not sure about the empire strikes back either. By the way, I think it's more about the dark side. So I'm, I'm, I'm going, I'm going with with the other Mark, Mark Knight in terms of. And I was persu- and I was persuaded by that. I, c- I could, <laughs> I could argue the point that right at the end, at, right at the end of Empire Strikes Back, or, or, or certainly of Jedi, we get a there is still good in him. But, but, <laughs> there is still good in that finance director. But but we, we can leave that. Well, I'm going with Strength in Numbers, episode four, New Hope. Um, the, the strength in numbers being our Jedi Knights um, and our young Padawans and our value makers and everybody else is going to... I think that's yeah. correct. I think that's the way we should take it. <laughs> Excellent. Well, listen, I wasn't expecting to stretch the Star Wars um, uh, as, as much as that, but I'm a massive fan of Star Wars. And, and listen, big fan of the, the theme as well, because I can see where you're going with it and I can see that this is, this is the moment we need to, um, to re-grip um, the, the finance, financial framework for the NHS in order to deliver on everything we need to do for patients, communities and, 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 and the services. And that. So I absolutely get that. So listen, tell us a bit more about your theme then. Tell us a bit more about, um, you, you, know, you said about, a bit about, about why you chose it, I suppose, and how that came about in terms of the, the, the um, Star Wars entry music as well that's behind that. But, but what can we expect in the year ahead, Lee? What are you going to just unpack a bit about, about what we can expect for the year ahead? I think the finance function is going to be on the back foot in the year ahead as it tries to reassert some form of, uh, of, 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 of position, of, of uh, authority, if you like, in, 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 in the way that the systems are running. I think Julian at a national level has got a really, really difficult job. 
in trying to get the whole thing to balance within uh to, not, not just to balance the money because you can balance the money but it's to balance the money and and do the things that the, 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 the government in particular want us to deliver on waiting lists access to urgent emergency care etc so i think it's i think for us there's a massive agenda ahead of trying to support the services in trying to do that i do think the the the, the possibly the biggest challenge is how we as systems identify and realize cash releasing opportunities for those of us who work in 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 any of the larger organizations large organizations our cost structures are really, really sets of semi-fixed costs uh, and really linked to capacity. There's a whole plethora of quality regulation out there now, which would suggest you can't just chip away at staffing levels like you might have done historically um, because safety and quality experience, they, they come to the fore. So the ability to actually manage your cost base is really really limited and therefore we're having to think slightly outside of the box we're having to think system-wide at where the opportunities can be and we as a finance community need to do two things i think one we've got to band together and part of that is strength in numbers the numbers being us as a community um so that we are talking as one that we are working collectively across communities, not just in organisations and silos like we might have done historically, um, in order to try and, uh, and, and, and get to the end of the challenge. I can't tell you how difficult I think balancing the plans is going to be this year. So I think the really difficult period is going to be from now until the, the final plans are signed off. Personally, I'm not convinced they're going to be signed off by the 31st of March. Yeah. I think we'll find ourselves in a situation like we were last year where the numbers are such that there'll be various iterations. Now, that's not going to be comfortable uh, hearing for, for, for Julian and the team at NHSE, uh, but, but I just don't think we're at a place mature maturity-wise across ICBs where we'll be able to, 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 to come up with the, the, all of the answers in the, in the first round of, of, of this. So I think that's going to happen. So, so I think that's a real interesting issue. Um, I think because of the pressure that this will put on teams, I think there's also something about the finance team sticking together and being clear about their purpose and their mission um, and therefore finding strength in knowing that they're doing the right thing. They're, they're not they're not out there to to cause um, upset and uh, to to de to deliberately sort of antagonize clinical and non clinical teams because they they're asking for a set of unrealistic demands or what might be perceived to be unrealistic demands so there's something about them taking some sort of strength in in understanding their own numbers in their own um, metrics, whether they're performance metrics or financial metrics, whatever, um, and in able to and, 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 and using that proactively with clinical teams, etc., to try and square the circle that we're trying to do. The very, the very last thing that I'm, I'm, I'm sort of aware of, and, and, I, and I didn't mention this when we had the conference, but I, but I will be mentioning this when we go when I go round to, uh, to the regional conferences, and this is m more of a personal issue, um, and it's about the psychological health of, of the finance staff. Um, people under pressure respond in different ways. I know that I can be really grumpy and, 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 and not much fun when I'm under a lot of pressure. People will be under pressure this year. The, yeah. num the numbers, the, s the way the system's set up, means there's gonna be a lot of pressure. Um, and we've got to look after one another. So again, part of the strength in numbers, a play on that is about making sure that we recognise the emotional, mental well-being of our teams and that we're supporting them and nobody's struggling unnecessarily because of the demands we're placing on them. So there's something about helping ourselves just look after one another. So I think, I think, I think it's a combination of all those sort of three, two or three things that I'm wanting to, to try to... Um, encourage and, uh, and and get people aware of as we progress through the year. No, I think that's really helpful, Lee. And, and um, 
Well, first of all, I think you're, we, well, we all know, don't we, and everybody listening to this um, will, will, will be living their version of the challenge we've now got coming out of this year uh, that we're currently in, exiting this year, which has been a bit of a break away from COVID. Um, we've got some additional funding and so and we're moving into an environment where um, we're left with the legacy that we've built up over the last three financial years during COVID, the additional cost base, the clear, clear reduction in productivity, um, and, um, and, and, a, and effectively a reduction in income uh, for the service in real terms. So uh, all of that is going to bring its challenges. And exactly as you said, um, I, I totally agree. I mean, I think I'd like to think that, I'd, and I'd more than like to think, I, I think I know that the finance community is one of the strongest professional communities in the NHS, isn't it? And I, I think you'd agree. And HMA's had a part to play in that as well. So I think, I think you calling that out as part of your strength in numbers theme and encouraging us to look out for each other and our teams and and beyond our organization as well as a it's a really positive positive uh, step and is something needed at this moment can i just ask about um when i heard your uh, your presidential um speech lee um, one of the things that stood out for me was that it was the ongoing commitment from hma through yourself as president this year to um to be more representative uh, to deliver more strength in depth as part of strength in numbers and and as part of that, what I heard was you know expanding the membership, expanding the interaction and the networking, uh, to make sure that we're representative of the whole finance function. And I know Owen Harkin got into this in some really positive ways around um, free membership for for uh, Jennifer for Change band staff uh, bands two to six uh, for the last year or so, which I know has had a big take up. Big take up here. It's about being able to get everybody in those bands in this organisation as a member. But um, but can you just say a bit more about how we're going to get more representation of the wider communities into our finance function and how you perhaps going to make that a bit of a cent- centrepiece to your theme as also, also working with one NHS finance I guess I th- I th- this is really difficult isn't it so, so, so Owen you're right was able to expand the membership offering it uh, free for, 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 for the lower graded staff and by all accounts that, that has had, had an impact we can see the, 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 the increase in numbers and I think that's starting to work if you like. We're continuing to see in particular um, growth in access to some of our digital offerings, some of our educational offerings, the, the bite-sized type things. Yeah. And I think I think that's really, really key for us in terms of trying to keep engagement. One of the key one of the really key things that I think HFMA does is that educational component. And and uh, yeah, I talked about launching two different qualifications one for lower banded staff and one for the very higher uh, the, the 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 most senior banded staff at the, at the conference and we'll we'll do that but but if i think about the vast majority of our members they're not finance directors they are members of the finance community i think i think continuing to improve on the range and volume of content particularly digital content which is short which is effective and is easy to access i think is going to be really key to 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 um, continuing to engage with uh, these uh, the, particularly the newer members because because at the end of the day you sort of said if you're a a, a a new entrant into finance in the NHS and somebody says we want you to join the NHS for me but they're going to sit and say what's in it for me well if we can if we can capture them with some engaging educational content um i think that that starts to help um for me in my early career um it, a lot of it was around the networks that it that it provided and the ability to see outside of a particular environment um and that's really key for where i am uh, in in the current in in, the, in my current climate um fascinating uh issues in 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 um in the east on the east coast in the east riding of and, and north lincolnshire in that if i think about hull and grimsby there's only one road in and out of these these communities and i talk to staff who've been in our organizations for 20 odd years and they've never been anywhere and looked at what other organizations are doing at what good practice exists elsewhere so it doesn't surprise me at times that I come across practices that I think, why are we still doing that? That disappeared years ago. 
And so I think the HFMA also has a role in, in, in doing that. But, in, but before you even get to that networking piece, because you can't be on courses and, and, and meetings every week, I think, I think the constant stream and availability of educational content, particularly for the, the vast majority of members, is where we will, we will make the biggest gains in that, in, 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 in that arena that you just described. Yeah, no, I, I think the, the, the move into the digital space has been a game changer, isn't it? And um, I mean, I suppose there was a point, wasn't it, perhaps a couple of years ago where I think we might have had, an, I think it might have been a completely virtual conference um, a couple of years ago, wasn't it? Yeah. The, the main conference. And um, we may have run out, run out of a, run out, well, I was going to say run out of a studio in London, but it's run out of Rochester Row, which is HMA headquarters in London, isn't it? But um, but yeah, but that but but what's really fascinated me is now we've got the perfect blend. So take take this year's yeah. conference we just had, for example, you know, we had a really thriving last three days, didn't we? Uh, yeah. Predominantly face to face. That said, though, that was also, I mean, you know, I was, I was taken by the fact there was at all times three hundred or so people online as well as the people in the room. Uh, and then at the beginning of the, the week, it was purely online, and that perfect blend, I think, is something we've struck on. And uh, and and the networks point. I mean, everybody mentions the networks point, don't they? I, the one bit of advice I give anybody I speak to that's at an earlier stage of their career is the networks. You can't underestimate the importance of that. Um, and that is about getting out from your desk sometimes, isn't it? That is about getting out and speaking to people. But um, So listen, um, that's all good stuff. You, you, you t- talk a bit about your, your local patch there. So I wonder whether we use that as a segue into um, getting into a bit more about you, you your job, your, your career and so on. So... I mentioned briefly at the start, Lee, um, but for listeners here, so you've worked in Hull um, as Chief Financial Officer for Hull University Hospitals for 10 years, I believe, and I've, I've taken on a second statutory uh, Chief Financial Officer role at North Lincolnshire and Gould NHS Foundation Trust since 2020. Um, if we go back a bit, you started in the NHS, I believe, in 1993, fresh out of university. Uh, you stayed at your first organisation, which was Sheffield Children's Hospital, for 13 years, gained your SEMA qualification along the way, became an FD for the first time in 2003 as your first director post. Uh, later on, you went on to become FD, of course, at Sherwood Forest Hospitals Foundation Trust uh, with some uh, short stints at the East Midlands Strategic Health Authority and with a team at Central Manchester Hospitals before you took on the role at Hull. So, and alongside all that, um, you've also spent 18 months as the lead finance officer for the Emerging Humber and North Yorkshire Integrated Care System. So you've packed a lot in there, Lee, and you've also had quite clearly um, some long stretches at some significant organisations. So um, just, just unwind a little bit. So um, why the NHS? So you, you joined the NHS straight from uni. Well, t- give us a bit more of an insight into your drivers around joining the NHS right back in the day. Well, it, it was it was more by it was more by accident rather than design. I can tell you, I I left. I graduated in ninety two, um, and uh, and interestingly, I went back to doing my summer job uh, in in the summer of ninety two, uh, forklift driving. Um, loved it. You don't have to think. All you have to do is drive around, pick stuff up, move it, drop it. Brilliant. Um, loved that, um, but but I sort of sat there and thought to myself, I didn't go to university and get a degree just to carry on being a forklift driver. Um, jobs at that time weren't the easiest thing to 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 to, to find, and I ended up through a through a, a temping agency getting a uh, initially it was a six week assignment at the children's hospital, and effectively I was faxing stuff, I was photocopying, so I was filing i was i was a very junior admin assistant and this was in 92 or to, in, 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 towards the end of 92 and nhs trusts and and, and the, the the kids hospital hadn't been a trust for very long so all its systems were in their infancy um there were invoices everywhere um it was a bit of a chaotic situation and i was help, asked to to, to help to, to do that and and I quite enjoyed the work and they asked me to stay and eventually they asked me to do a, a, a permanent job and I can remember that first job I got um, it was advertised at ten and a half thousand pounds which I thought oh that'd be nice um, but they said because you've got no experience we're not going to pay you that we'll only pay you nine and a half thousand 
So I, uh, I, uh, I can remember taking that job and at the, the, the first permanent job I had, which was in 93, uh, was, uh, was basically being the debt collector. Right. So, 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 <laughs> so at that point, I was the debt collector for the kids' hospital, chasing GP fund holding practices and, 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 uh, and doing that sort of stuff. Um, but what was fascinating for me was working in the NHS and working in a small hospital in particular was the variety of roles that I soon became sort of aware of and, and, and had experience of. And I, and I just went from one role to another. I was very lucky in, in some regards in that job opportunities appeared at the right times. I was in the right place and, and I, I, I moved through the organisation. I, I moved, soon moved into management accounts and, and, and started to move through the organisation, looking at how a, an acute hospital worked. And again, working in a small hospital, you got to see the whole of it rather than maybe just one di- directorate that you might see if you're working in one of the very large acutes. Um, so I was, so like I say, coming into the NHS was more by luck than judgment, but the NHS was very good to me. The opportunities to do my professional training were made available to me. Um, and and I developed a loyalty and and a, and, a, and a liking for the for the service, so s- stuck with it. Oh, fantastic! So, what was your degree then? In, in, in so university? I did, so I did a degree in accountancy and finance. You did right okay. at, at Hull. But what I will tell you is, when I left, I absolutely knew nothing about accountancy and finance. <laughs> and and it was only when I started doing the the very basic management accounting stuff, and I, I was having to prepare journals. That I thought to myself, oh my, debits and credits. Now, which hand was which? Um, and, uh, and, and so it was, a, it, was the, it was the day job that started to, to sort of, and the use of, and, the, and the routine of having to fill journals in and do the sort of stuff that our, our management accounting teams do day in, day out, that started to, to really get me into the proper sort of accounting disciplines that I'd come across at university but not really learnt in the way that you need to. Interesting. I always ask because, um, and, and, you know, and, and invariably the answer is accountancy or business or economics in my case or whatever else, but, but it's amazing the amount of um, finance directors I come across who are, you know, did a biology degree or a geography degree or something else. And um, that's the advice I give given my, my, my eldest now around, uh, he's, he's end of first year of A-levels at the moment and... Um, Trying to think what to do at university, he hasn't got a clue by the way what he wants to do. And I just think, just go with what you go, with what your heart is, go with what you're good at, and it'll all work out, you know. So you haven't. So point being, you haven't got to necessarily be a no. be an be an accountant through university to. Uh, no, to I, I I wasn't sure whether or not I wanted to. But I still think to myself, I'd have been a better lawyer than I would have been an accountant. <laughs> um, and 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 the other thing, when I did my exams, I wanted to, I wanted to do some more exams. I wanted to do the tax exams. Right. Um, but. There really isn't a lot of call for a tax specialist in the NHS. No, no. Um, we can so, make a bit of money, a bit of money on the side, though, Lee. Perhaps, particularly, particularly last month, you know, tax return time. Yeah. Um, so, so listen. So, so, so I'm really, really fascinated. So I didn't know this about you. So, you, so, um, so you left university. You forklift driver. There you go. That, that's, a, that's a sound bite right there, isn't it? Uh, joined the NHS. Um, quickly got yourself into being a debt collector. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then worked your way through. So, um, no, fascinating. Listen, let's get into your current role, if you don't mind, because what yeah. I see at the moment is so many organisations across the country now are getting into group structures, um, stretching across, you know, so, so it was mergers and acquisitions, wasn't it, maybe yeah. five, ten years ago. Now it's, we're, the, 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 we're into sort of um, groups maintaining statutory bodies as independent organisations, but over a sort of shared leadership structure. So in your case, um, if I understand it, if I'm up to date, so, so, for, so you've got the two roles in the two organisations. So you're the shared uh, chief financial officer, combined turnover of £1.3 billion, pounds, so massive uh, amount of uh, cost base. Employ 15,000 staff across the organisation. I understand that you share a chairman, obviously share a CFO, which is you. I recently appointed a chief information officer across the two as well. And you're engaging on the possibility of moving to the next steps of a group structure. Is that, is that where you are? So Absolutely. So... so- We've we've got a an interim group uh, chief people officer, right? Um, so so um, there's a, that, that's in post, and we've just recently been out to advert for a group chief executive. 
Yeah, I saw that. Um, yeah. so, so, so unfortunately, they weren't able to, uh, to to make an appointment with this particular process. So I think that that process is going to be rerun again in the coming uh, weeks and months. Uh, but there is a definite commitment and direction of travel to, to bring the organisations closer together across the Humber. Um, as much as anything, that, that's a reflection of the need uh, for clinical pathways across the Humber to be far more uh, coterminous um, and, compl- and complementary for, for, for the populations, for the population centres that are dotted around the, the Humber estuary. Um, so, so it's a, a definite direction of travel we're, we're working on, and, uh, uh, it, but, it's, but it's still in its formative stages. No, that's fair. That's, and as they, they always are, they? I've got a similar experience here where um, we've got an acute partnership um, with the Isle of Wight Trust, and, uh, between Isle of Wight Trust Sports Hospitals, and we're, we're just, just about to take that next step into, into, into joint leadership as well. So, um, so listen, what, um, what, what I'm really interested in, and I'm sure some of our listeners will be interested also, is perhaps some of, the, some of what you've learned along the way. They, they must, they must, I'm, looking, I'm looking at you, by the way, and I'm going to put a, I've taken a picture as, uh, and I'm going to post, post it on social media, but I'm looking at you, Lee, now, so I'm visualising this now for the people listening on this podcast. So um, you've got your backdrop is the Humber Bridge. And as you just described, the two trusts that you are CFO at are kind of either side of that stretch of water, yeah? Yeah. So what have you learned along the way? Um, what, what are the differences in practice you've seen in the two organisations? How have you managed to blend? Have, it, what, yeah, have you managed to overcome that? Because I'm really interested in this because I've got a stretch of water that's not dissimilar. It's called the Solent between here and yeah. the Isle of Wight. Um, it's, it's fascinating, isn't it? So... so, so there's a level of distrust that exists and it has always existed between the populations on both sides of this river. Um, there's, a, there's, a, there's a fear of the Viking invaders from the north. Um, and, it, and, it, and it's fascinating. I went down to um, meet with the team, the finance team on the south of the river. And, and, I, and for, for, a, for a small... Stru- so I've been doing this role for almost two and a half years now. And... And, 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 and interestingly, um, when I first went, I was having a meeting first thing on a Monday morning with my sort of senior team in Hull. And then half an hour later, I'd have a meeting with the senior team in, 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 in Enlake. And I sat there thinking to myself, why am I doing two of these things? Um, so we've tried to, to pull stuff together. And what's been really, really good for me is seeing how my teams, the finance teams, have taken to that. And we've put together uh, a more a more conjoined senior structure where we can. Right. So a lot of our financial services are provided um, the the same way now. We're on the single ledger system. We're just in the process of procuring a single costing system. Um, but the teams themselves um, are really um, quite happy to work together and it's really quite helpful isn't it if you're a particularly if you're a management accountant if I say why would you do this um, they're able to talk to their counterparts north or south of the river and say how do you do this down there so there is something about the a, a really short-term win has been the ability to just go and ask each other questions and say how do you approach this in terms of the organ and, 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 we're, and we're starting to join more and more functions up as you rightly described we've got information and, and IT uh, the people f- uh, functions are now are now coming together and we'll and we will we will look at all of the other sort of disciplines as, as we move forward so it's a really I think quite an exciting um, period but for me personally it's been really quite difficult in that until we're really clear on on how we're going to operate as a, a group I've effectively been trying to do it almost like having two jobs. Yeah, I can imagine two boards, two finance committees, two, two everything, board, I guess. Absolutely. And that, that bit is where the problems start to, to lie um, because you run out of time. Uh, you don't have enough time. You spread too thin. And, and at that point, you, you, you start to think to yourself, you're going to start... Because as, as, as we all know, we're, we've all got lots and lots of... Metaphorically, we've got lots of plates spinning at any one point. The worry is you're going to start dropping plates. Um, and therefore, it's not a tenable uh, solution to continue doing two jobs in isolation uh, for the longer term. So I'm hopeful that we will make more more progress in this regard soon and we'll start to 
streamline some of the governance processes so I don't have to go to two of everything. But but what has been really helpful in supporting me in this is my team. And again, strength in numbers comes into this. My team have been really, really helpful in 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 putting up with me being late for things or or not doing stuff because I've just pulled a little thin and they and they've actually stood up and they've taken more on, which they might in an ordinary world not have had to do, but they are having to do and are doing so uh, without any problems. Um, and so I have uh, people going across the river r- routinely now. Yeah. Um, and, and obviously the, the, the technology is helping. So, so you, we talked earlier about COVID and, and, um, and the, the, the introduction of teams almost simultaneously um the, the 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 technology the ability to video conference now means that i can do so much more remotely with my teams that actually the stretch of water and the geography is not such an issue yeah or certainly not the issue it could have been five years ago no absolutely so listen you, you you've been doing this now over a couple of years you said and yeah. many many of us are embarking on similar journeys but um but a few steps perhaps behind where where you've been over the last few years then so so what, what's the biggest thing you've learned along the way what what's the thing that perhaps you, you wish you knew then that you've learned along the way or, or a bit of advice you give to the likes of myself and others getting into sort of group roles i think the key piece for me is to remain objective because the real the really difficult bit is to to, to go into another organization and go well this is the way that we do it and it's better because it isn't better, it's different. Now, there will be things that you have done historically that will be better, but there are also things I've seen from going into another organisation that are better than what my previous organ, my home host organisation, if you like, that they do. So the ability to, to, to take an independent stance, to look at things objectively, and to be able to, to be self-critical and say, do you know what? We can learn here. Both sides... So I sit there thinking to myself, I was, in a, I was in a senior meeting the other day and I'm sat talking through the numbers and I'm thinking to myself, I'm hoping I've got the right numbers here and I'm not telling the wrong, the wrong board, the wrong, <laughs> the wrong set of numbers. So, so there is something about, about making sure that you're very clear about where you are at, at all times. But, but, but being objective and the ability to go, do you know what, I like that that could work better in that organisation or vice versa. I think that's the key, that's been the key for me. And what you've also got to remember is whenever you, you go into these things, there are people who are sat thinking to themselves, I'm worried about what this might mean for, for themselves professionally, sure. for their sure. own careers, they've got their own, they've got their own sort of motivations for work. Um, it's to not take anything not make any assumptions about where people are coming from because there are umpteen uh, ways in which people can get upset by this process. Um, and you've got to work that through very, very carefully and sensitively with, with all parties. And that's, and that, that's not easy at times. Um, there's, a, there's a direction of travel. We've got to take everybody with us um, we know that with any sort of change, there's going to be people that aren't necessarily bought into it. As long as we're sure it's the right thing to do and we can argue why it's the right thing to do, that's okay. But you've got to be sensitive and, and, and independent as much yeah. as possible. Thank you, Lee. I, 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 that is really helpful, actually. I, um, I like the objectivity point, um, particularly. I like a lot of that. I like the objectivity point, particularly. Um, because it's always learning, isn't it, from all sides of the equation um, and, and all vantage points, and it's about getting the best to be to be to get the best some of the parts then as well, isn't it? So absolutely, absolutely good advice, Lee. All right, listen, um, let's get into a bit, bit about you, the person, then, Lee. So um, we've heard about presidential theme. Um, what you're going to be doing there? We've heard a bit about the job you're currently doing. Just tell us a bit more about you. What, what do you do outside of work to relax? Tell us a bit more about Lee, the person. <laughs> so, so I'm uh, uh, la- last week. Um, I. I returned, so I've just I've just come back from having a. I I I said to uh, Joanne, I said I'm I'm going away for a long weekend. She said, When are you going? I said, uh, I'm going uh, Wednesday. And she said, When are you back? I said, Tuesday. Right. She said, 
I'm not entirely sure that's a long weekend, but I spent a, a weekend with some friends of mine um, snowboarding in, oh. uh, in the Italian Alps. Um, so in the, in the winter, I do like to get away one, once or so. Uh, I've got one of my best friends who I grew up with. He lives out in, in Bulgaria now. And, uh, and so I, t- I like to get out and uh, get to the mountains and, and, and get to some wide open spaces. What I will tell you is whether I'm doing that in the winter or I'm mountain biking in the summer. And, and again, I like to, uh, to, 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 to uh, do the downhill mountain biking. It's one of those environments where you can It's not like lying on a on a sunbed next to a pool where you could you, you could be get found guilty of not being able to switch off completely because you sat there thinking about work. Uh, when you're on a snowboard, or when you're on a bike coming down a mountain, um, you're not thinking about work. That that doesn't come into your, into your thoughts. Um, so I like to get, when I get away, I like to 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 to, to properly get away, um, and I still like to be, I like to be still quite active as far as possible although i am getting a bit older now wow i i, I certainly wouldn't have wouldn't have known that about you lee and uh, we learned something every day so a bit of an adrenaline junkie then so snowboarding in the winter downhill mountain biking in the summer wow that sounds um that sounds a bit of a rush uh, indeed so uh fantastic um excellent so good stuff listen while we get into the quick fire round i got some questions here listen um you, you haven't got to explain the answers. It's just, it's just uh, whatever pops into your head. Um, just to, again, just a little bit of the listeners, really, and our members for HMA, just get to know our president a bit more, if that's all right. So I've got um, half a dozen or so uh, quick fire rounds, and I've introduced a, a sprinkling of new questions in here as well to keep you on your toes. So the first one is, um, what were you doing right before this conversation, Lee? Right before this conversation? I was trying to get this technology to work. <laughs> Fair enough. Uh, I know that, of course, from when we joined. So there you go. Um, what's the last book you read? Oh, uh, now that was a book about... The last book I read was a fantastic book. It was about a race between some of the most... Uh, or the best um, endurance athletes in the world racing against a tribe of Mexican Indians who run barefoot in the mountains of Mexico. And it was a, a piece written by a guy who was a journalist from the Men's Health magazine. And the serious part to the book was basically uh, a, a set of theories as to why you don't actually need expensive running shoes and why the human body's adapted and, and, and why you're just as good running barefoot. It's a fascinating book, but it's re- really interesting about these, uh, these, this tribe of Mexican Indians who can run and run and run. Wow, I wasn't expecting that answer. So I, I could tell my son that he doesn't need the new Nike carbon plated no. uh, running uh, shoes anymore then, yeah? And, ap- <laughs> and apparently, apparently the, the guys at night recognize this, <laughs> but quite clearly, it's a, it's a bit like, it's a bit like, I suppose, the oil sheiks in, in, in the Middle East, <laughs> recognising that, that oil-powered vehicles are probably not the way forward, but they're not, they're not, about, to, they're not about to sell that just yet. <laughs> Excellent. All right, the last film you watched? The last film I watched? Oh, I watched, uh, I watched Maverick, night before last. It was on the telly. Top Gun 2. Oh, do you know what? As, uh, I, 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 like, I like films. I, I love Star Wars. I love Back to the Future. Um, I, I love Rocky, the Rocky yeah, scene. Yeah, yeah. But, but Maverick, my gosh, that's got straight to the top of my uh, film list. Yeah, yeah it, was very, it. It, was, it was very good. Very good film. Very good film. All right, good stuff. Uh, your bossy perfect weekend, Lee? What would be your perfect weekend? My perfect weekend is getting up on a Saturday morning. Um, so so, so this, this, this has changed with age. So nowadays, it's getting up on a Saturday morning, going mountain biking with my friends in the Peak District, um, and then going to the pub around four-ish to watch final score, watch the early evening match, few beers, and then an early night. That's, that's my perfect Saturday. For the vast majority of my adult life, it would have been slightly different. It would have been getting up and going and playing football, and then, oh. and then doing that. But I, I don't play football uh, anymore so uh, well not really a bit of five aside and that's about it so uh, so now the, the mountain biking with the guys I used to play football with has taken over 
Excellent. Uh, I'm enjoying this. We're getting to learn a bit more about you, about you behind the scenes. This. this is really good. So, Lee, uh, next one. Um, when was the last time you laughed out loud? Uh, when I was on holiday with the lads, um, there was a particular, a particular issue that was uh, not for repeating, um, but it was rather amusing. Um, what, what my missus would say, boy humour. All right, we'll leave that on there then, perhaps. You can tell me later. All right, proudest moment of your, your career so far, Lee? Uh, proudest moments. Uh, one was uh, getting the kids' hospital through its FT application. Yeah. Um, I was 32 years old, relatively new as a, an FD at that point, and, uh, and, and going through that, that process at that time, which was a difficult process, and, and they were the first child, specialist children's hospital to have gone through. Um, so it was a real, real, uh, a real uh, sort of challenge. That was that was particularly uh, good. Another another standout moment was was winning the deputy director of the year award at the HFMA conference. Now I didn't win it; my deputy won it, and it was the f- it was the first year that that award had been uh, made. So it was the first time they did have made that award, and my deputy won it. But I was particularly proud with, with of her and the team for um, being able to get themselves into a position where they were able to apply and then ultimately win. And that was quite a, that was quite a, a fun experience. And then more recently, I have to say, uh, and, and, and it might sound a little corny, but, but actually being asked to be president and, and the, 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 the conference just prior to Christmas, I suppose is, 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 is almost a crowning glory. Yeah, no, I was, I was expecting the HMA presidential role to come in this somewhere. I mean, it's, it's a fantastically uh, proud opportunity, isn't it, to yeah, represent, it is. the, represent the association um, in the way. So, uh, yeah, well, well done. And, well, and, well, and, and listen, uh, wish you well in the year. My last one on the quick fire round then is um, it's something you touched upon earlier on, but I'm going to ask you the question. Really. You talked about uh, strength in numbers, you talked about well being, talked about looking out for each other during these difficult times. So, my, my quick fire round question to you, I suppose, Lee, then is so where, where do you get your support from? I t- <laughs> a couple of things. So, I get it from, from, the, from my family at home. Um, so, uh, so, so, so they, they provide a lot of support. They don't give me a lot of sympathy, but they do provide some support. But, 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 but more interestingly, and you may, may smile at this, um, on a Saturday morning, I might be out with the lads on the bikes, and the, the, we talk about all sorts. And every now and again, I might even be on call. And what they'll say to me is, what do you do? Why are you on call? You're an accountant. And, and, and then they'll get into the subject of beds. And I'll say there's a shortage of beds and they can't understand why we've not gone to B&Q and bought a load of bunk beds. Um, and some of the things that they say are so ridiculous, but in a very perverse way, they bring me back to earth, hmm. bring me back down to actually, it's, it's difficult stuff, but it, bring, it gives me a sense of perspective and grounding. Um, and at times, I need the, um, I just need that, that release of being out with friends and them taking the mickey, if you like, Yeah. in order to sort of say, okay, don't take yourself quite so seriously, relax a little. Because one of the really, I think one of the really difficult things with, a finance career, a long finance career, is how hard it is to turn off, how hard it is. So there have been times in my career where I've gone home and I've, I've, I've worked really, really late at night and, and you, don't, you, you, you just don't turn off. You, you're so, you're motivated, but, but, it, but the demands of the job are so much that you'll never, you'll never finish it. Um, so I think one of the really big life skills that I've learned is about being able to turn off, to be, to, to be able to say, right, I've done that, I've, I can't do any more at the moment, I'm, I'm going to have some time for me. And for me, team sport, whether that's the biking, whether it's the football, whether it's the snowboarding, that's where I get my biggest release. Lee, thank you so much for this conversation. I really enjoyed it. And I think you've, um, 
in, in getting to know you a bit more towards the back end of this podcast particularly I think we've probably started to understand a bit more about your motivations uh, behind strength in numbers and, and, and where and where perhaps we'll see this, the association driving forward this year so thank you um, I, I suppose I just might have one more question if that's okay which yeah. is which, just a quick one I suppose which uh, with the benefit of experience um, is, it, is there anything you'd like to if, if you could meet your younger self now back in the day when you were you know on that forklift track or Debt collecting in the first role in the NHS, you know, right back in the day, is what, what would be the the benefit of experience? What would be the one thing you'd say to yourself back then? I think I, th- I think part of that comes back to what you were saying about your son, um, and about him not knowing what he wants to do. I didn't know what I wanted to do when I when I took that 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 temping job at the kids' hospital, and and it's taken me down a road, and I've enjoyed every minute of it. Genuinely enjoyed every minute of it, and part. Of, People do sometimes say, don't they, about the, the finance director, well, why do you do it? And actually, I still enjoy it. Um, I meet a lot of very interesting people, and the day job is never the same. There is so much going on. Um, but my, my, I suppose that the biggest thing it would be, don't worry so much about, I need to get a job, or I need to get a mortgage, or I need to do this or that. You're here for a long time, hopefully. Just... Let life, life, life just has a habit of has a habit of happening. I think, and and I just think to myself, especially for the young people, I say this to my kids. I say, don't worry about it. I said, you you're likely to be working till you're nearly seventy. You're in your twenties. There's a lot of life left, so don't don't think to yourself you're in a rush because you're not. Good advice. And, and any final words, Lee, to members of the association or anyone else from the finance community listening to this podcast right now? I, I mean, I'm hopeful that the, that the finance communities will thrive this year under some very difficult uh, circumstances. So, so, so I think we've got a, a real leadership role um, in, in, in getting that to happen. Obviously, I'm, I'm hopeful that the HFMA is able to, to build on what it's currently doing. The way it's rebuilt itself from the pandemic, I think, is, is, is really, really impressive and hopefully will continue to do so and, and will mean more to, to more people. And if I can encourage the youngest, newest members of my finance team to get involved, those who want to. I don't say they have to, and, and I'm very clear on that. There's a lot of people who work in my teams who just want to come to work and go home. And I have no issues with that. But for those who want to and who have a degree of, as- of ambition and aspiration, I think that whether it's... that In terms of their career development, I think they can go a lot worse than getting involved with the HFMA. Thank you, Lee. And thank you to everyone listening. And thank you for choosing uh, HMA Talk. If you listen to this in this uh, In Conversation series on HMA Talk, please do spread the word, as well as subscribing to HMA Talk on your podcast app. Uh, And if there's anyone else you'd like me to have a conversation with, please do get in touch. But until next time, thank you for listening. And as our new HFMA president has reminded us, we're not alone. We are one NHS finance family, and we do indeed have strength in numbers. So take good care, look after yourself, and let's look after each other also. Thank you.